So this will be the coronavirus four video. And I thought, I thought it's probably time that we should really focus on vaccination since that's one of the immunological aspects of this pandemic that everybody's looking to, to finally let us out, out of uh, jail, <laughs> you know. So in order to learn, to, to really understand what the, what the pros and the cons, the difficulties and so forth are with vaccination, you really, I think, and of course this is my philosophy for everything, is you have to take an historical approach to the whole question. And if you do that, then you can finally get an appreciation of where we are now if we go back to the beginning. And in the beginning, the, the beginning was 1798 in England. And that was the year that, that Edward Jenner, who was a country physician um, uh, just to the west of London in the Oxford um, County, that, that um, published a monograph on his experiments with um, cowpox virus or cowpox material to try to protect against smallpox. And smallpox was a major problem at the time. It accounted for 10% of, the, of, the, of deaths worldwide. It accounted for most of the blindness because when they got the pox virus into their eyes, they would scar over and they basically couldn't see because their cornea were all scarred up. And smallpox was, was not a, necessarily a pandemic, but it was epidemic at various points in time throughout the history of the last or the two or three four hundred years before the 18th century the end of the 18th century and when it would come through a community it would basically the interesting thing was there was a certain fraction of the of the of the inhabitants of the town or the village that would remain unscathed and um for the most part, these were individuals who'd already been through an epidemic in, in years past. And so it was well known that if you survived, if you survived smallpox, then you were basically immune to a re-encounter with that same um, uh, bug. Now we know that smallpox is a virus, but and, and it was described as, as Jenner in his monograph as a virus, but nobody knew what a virus was back in 1798. It was just a word, and um, and in Latin it meant poison. And the other thing about uh, about that time period was is that it was it was also well known in the community that um, the young women who were milkmaids, because in his in his county and so forth, um, it was a it was a farming community and, and a dairy community, and it was well known that cows would get a similar kind of a, an infliction where they would have pustules that the, would develop that it wouldn't be disseminated throughout the body, it would only be on their udders. And the, of course the milkmaids milking the cows would get the same kinds of lesions on their hands. Um, but they were self-limited and they would go away and, and um, then once they, once they had that, the milkmaid was essentially immune again. Um, to a reintroduction of that same thing, and they wouldn't they wouldn't get any lesions on their hands anymore, and that was well known. And so, the the whole word immune and and go also goes back to Latin, and it means exempt. Usually, back in in the Roman days, it was exempt from military service. So you you were immune if if you know if the if the Caesar or whoever. Um, granted you immunity, then you didn't have to go serve in the army. Um, so what Jenner noticed was, was, so he knew about the fact that, that um, for, on the one hand, smallpox would render somebody immune and that cowpox would also render somebody immune. The, the, the going um, uh, treatment at the time was, was called inoculation because from Asia back in the centuries before, it was common practice to take to take fluid or take material from a from a smallpox pustule, and um, and then inject it into the uh, under into the skin, usually um, uh, of a of a non um, of a susceptible individual. And for the most part, and, and in England, particularly at that time, the the physicians would set up 
inoculation clinics where they would have sort of an outpatient situation where they would do the inoculation, but then it, they would they would have the patients stay overnight for, for a few days in their in their uh, inpatient part of the clinic, and if they got any adverse problems with with the inoculation, they would nurse them through. And different physicians um, advertised that they only had like a one percent mortality rate, whereas whereas when an epidemic would come through the town the mortality rate overall in the population was like 30 percent so it would just it would wipe through the town and that was not good and of course most adults were worried about their their children because the adults who had probably been, been had survived the epidemic so jenner said said to himself well you know maybe we should we, maybe there's a better way than this inoculation because it's dangerous in and of itself. And maybe if we took some um, some of these pustules from the milkmaids that had cowpox on their hands or their arms or whatever, and injected that into in, into susceptible individuals, maybe that would help. And he the monograph that he published in 1798, he had sent it off. He'd sent this off um, previously a couple of three years before that. To the Royal Society, and they just they they sat on it, and then they they farmed it off to the agricultural section because it had to do with cows, and and they didn't publish it. So he took it, and this is the part of the story that I really like. He took it upon himself to um, to find a, a publisher in London, and he paid for the public publication himself. It's, it's the hell with this this Royal Society business, and. Um, the, th the monograph is just an absolutely beautiful um, uh, exposition of science from the 18th and early 19th century. And because what it is, is, is a case reports of, I think, like 20 different individuals where he would very meticulously describe where he got the material from that he was injecting into the new people and so forth. And then and, and what happened to them and, and whether they, you know, got in, got in a an illness or not and so forth. Ultimately, to make a long story very short, he decided that he needed, he thought that it was conferring immunity, but he didn't know that. And so he figured that the only way to do this, and this is important for our total story up with coronavirus today, he decided to challenge uh, an individual. And the first, the first individual was a little boy who lived down the street, who was only eight years old. And he challenged the little boy with, with pustules from a smallpox person after he'd been um, vaccinated with the um, cowpox, which, which was thought to be the, a similar but different virus. Um, and the little boy got, for the first 24 hours, he got a little bit feverish. He had these swollen lymph nodes under his arm where he got the, the, the challenge and so forth. Um, but then after a day or so, a day or two, he gradually got better and he was fine. Well then, um, Jenner worried that he didn't give a big enough dose. So he had that little boy come back again and he gave a bigger dose. And lo and behold, the, the little boy did fine. He didn't have any sequelae and, and, and so forth. And so then he went on, Jenner went on and he did the same sort of thing with several other people and that's what he published. And the good news about this whole story is, is that ultimately, because everybody was so worried about this disease, that it went worldwide. It was spread worldwide and, and everybody took it up and everybody wanted some of Jenner's vaccines and, and he sent um, cowpox material all over the world, to India, to the States, and so forth and so on. And he was hailed as being, you know, a rock star in the time, except in England. Because in England, the, the other physicians who had had their inoculation clinics, they didn't want him to introduce this cowpox thing because then they didn't need the clinics anymore. And then they needed to get material from, from Jenner. So they, they so, you know, it's just one, one story about how science and politics and so forth enter into things. But that was the beginning. And, and the thing is, is that um, 
The thing about the compox virus was that Jenner knew, uh, and also becomes important as we go forward in the whole vaccination history, is, is that the, the obviously the cowpox substance, whatever it was, the cowpox virus, it was alive. And what it would do is it would set up a little infection uh, underneath the skin, and the, the area where it was inoculated would get um, the classic signs of inflammation and red, hot, swollen, and sore last um, several days, a week to 10 days, and then it would gradually subside. Um, and that was called the take. If you, if you got that reaction where you had your smallpox vaccination, I, I can't remember which side I had it in, this side or that side. You can't see my scar anymore, but we used to have to show our scars uh, when we got uh, in, at school to, to make sure that we've been uh, uh, vaccinated with vaccinia became the, the word for the, for, the, for the vaccination. And actually, that, so that comes from the word vash um, in, in Latin, I guess, and then in French, which means cow. And so vaccine, the whole word comes from that whole thing. So that went on then in the entire 19th century, really. And people figured that people, the idea was that this was a special case for smallpox. And it wouldn't be applied, couldn't be applied to other uh, contagious or infectious diseases that, that everybody knew about. And, you know, they had scarlet fever and diphtheria and syphilis and all kinds of maladies. And, and for the most part, and, and nothing changed until Louis Pasteur came along almost a hundred years later, 18, uh, his first debut in immunology was in 1880. But this time he was, was an established, he was the rock star. He'd already um, become famous in France and, and worldwide for his accomplishments in organic chemistry and then in microbiology uh, before he even got into immunology in the late 19th century and his first um, his first vaccine was for a disease called chicken cholera um, and it, it was a it was a neurological problem it wasn't a dog you know we, we talk about cholera being you have massive diarrhea and so forth chicken cholera evidently was a, was a wasting disease of the chickens and they would get uh, neurological problems and so forth and um, Pasteur isolated the, the, the bacteria uh, that caused chicken cholera and he underwent a series of uh, manipulations uh, growing the bacteria in his laboratory and he uh, came upon an idea where, he, where he, if he grew it under high oxygen concentrations for a long time period kept passing and passing and passing the, the bugs that they would become attenuated, and that which meant that they were not virulent anymore, but they were still alive. And so live attenuated uh, vaccines became Pasteur's really um, signature um, uh, contribution to the field of vaccination. And he went on from 1880 in chicken cholera to then anthrax in 1881, uh, and then to, uh, to and so, the thing about Pasteur, he was smart uh, because he, he didn't try to deal with human diseases right away. So he dealt with, you know, um, barnyard diseases, or the domestic animals that all the farmers in France, and of course farming, farmers in France were at the tippy tippy tip top of the social order. If you were a farmer, then you, you know, you couldn't mess with the farmers. You still can't really in France. Um, Anyway, he, so he, he got this thing for chicken cholera, um, and then he moved on to cows that were having difficulty with anthrax. And they were losing herds of, of cattle uh, and also sheep uh, due to anthrax. And so he came up with a, a vaccine for anthra anthrax in 1885, and it was the same story. He said it had to be live but attenuated, and he had a secret method to make it attenuated. Secret way that he cultured things, and he, he sort of kept his lab notebooks, which he meticulously kept under lock and key. He didn't even let his lab, other people in his lab, read his lab notebooks. 
his family kept them under the wraps for another hundred years. And it wasn't until 1976 that people started reading what Pasteur really did. So then in 1885, he, um, uh, and, and what they did with chicken cholera and, and also with, with anthrax is that they would, they had a perfect situation. So what you do is you immunize half of the, half of the flock or half of the herd and you had leaving the other half as a control group and then you challenge those animals with with live bugs and there was a famous uh, trial that he that pastor did in 1885 where he showed that his anthrax vaccine was miraculous and it protected uh, half of the uh, all of the animals that got it and, and all the animals that were served as a control group died he then moved on from there to to humans, and he um, he picked another disease that was not an um, an epidemic disease like chicken cholera and anthrax and smallpox before, but rather sort of an endemic disease and a sporadic disease, and that was rabies. Rabies was was would travel around in in uh, wild animals and also and then domestic animals primarily dogs would get it and it was a severe disease and a terrible way to to, to die um, with rabies and the interesting thing about rabies was is that it was a disease whereby it was a long incubation period it could be weeks and months from the time from the time that you got infected with bites until the time that you came down with the disease and the disease was again a severe neurological uh, catastrophe essentially well that long incubation period gave Pasteur a time to try to do a therapeutic vaccination in other words you don't try to prevent the disease it wasn't a prophylactic vaccination it was a therapeutic vaccination that he could intervene with from the time of the bite until the uh, before the, the person came down with a um, uh, with rabies and the there's all kinds of stories but the, the story is that it worked well if it worked then then everybody said well you see we got it in time if it didn't work and the person went on to to die of rabies then they'd say well we didn't get it in time and so so they pot fed in terms of a uh, of a bench <laughs> but to see what pastor had done he started out as an organic chemist and he ended up in human medicine it was quite a quite a whole gamut over the course of the 19th century well what what he maintained was just like smallpox and Jenner before him that in order for the vaccine to to take to be a good vaccine and to work you had to have a live uh, microbe so that it would replicate in the host but it had to be attenuated so that it wouldn't cause disease and that was the gospel then, from there on after. And he, he also said that if, because of his experience with these methods, secret methods that he had in order to make these vaccines, that you could, if, if you knew what you were doing, you could do this to every, any, any, to every infectious disease, to all the maladies that people had been, you know, um, had to deal with over the course of his, human history. Um, and so thereafter, all of, all of medicine and all of science, particularly immunological science, which was just beginning right at the turn of the 20th century between 1890 and, and then beyond, um, that, was, that was it. That's what you had to do to make a vaccine. Well, the next thing that happened in the history of all this business was in 1890, just five years after uh, uh, after rabies, or after Pasteur and get the big time of these rabies vaccines, there was a group. Uh, Pasteur had a competitor, and because um, the people were jealous of his success, I suppose, and his competitor was Robert Koch, K O C H, who was really the um, uh, the really the father of infectious disease and, and bacteriology because he showed just before um, Pasteur came up with his anthrax back, back, vaccine, Robert Koch 
showed that the he cultured the, the, the bug that caused anthrax and just just a few years before and um, as a consequence over the next decade or so uh, they the German the Germans and of course you know there was a problem between the French and the Germans you know and they had the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and and Pasteur himself really never really liked the Germans very much he was a he was a very uh, uh, conservative um, French patriot kind of a guy. But lo and behold, in 1890, from the, the Koch Institute in Berlin, there were two investigators that were working on two different diseases. Uh, Emil uh, von Behring, German, I was a German fellow who was working on diphtheria, and um, a Japanese investigator um, by the name of Kitasato. Uh, and Kitasato was working on tetanus, lockjaw. And they got together in Berlin and they did a s series of experiments in diphtheria and also in tetanus, whereby they um, immunized animals um, with, these, with material from these two different bugs and diseases. And they and they waited, and then they could show that they were they were um, vaccinated and resistant. They then took the the plasma, the, the blood plasma from these animals, and transferred it to new animals. And then they challenged the new animals, and the new animals were fine. And that was the beginning of antibody activity. And the activity was that you were resistant to infection. And they didn't know what it was. So that was 1890. And that was the beginning of antibodies. And it was really a critical time in immunology because prior to that time, nobody knew where this immune response came from. Um, they sort of, there were, there were investigators and, and experiments that thought it came from cells. And, and the cells that they thought were mediating it were primarily macrophages. But by eight, then, in 1890, there was the whole the whole thing shifted from cells to what they what became known as humoral immunity. And the the humoral means that it was fluid, and um, and the immunity then was due to these these, uh, these antibodies. Well, then, for the the entire and I've gone through this before in terms of uh, I think the first chapter of my book, molecular immunity. The whole first half of the 20th century, immunology was really focused on, on trying to understand what the molecular basis of antibodies, the antibody activity actually were. And by 1960, they figured it out. And, and so that they knew that, that these um, antibodies were part of a, of a class of molecules that became known as immunoglobulins. They ultimately found the structure of these things, and, and, and the structure is sort of like a Y with antigen binding sites on two, the two arms of the Y, and that there were you know, several different classes of antibodies, I think five in the human, uh, that differed just a little bit by their, uh, by their structures. And, and so this was a big deal. And the thing is, in, in back to, to vaccines, the the um, the test for a successful vaccination that that was then applied was is that it had to to make antibodies. You, so you, you gave the person or the animal or whatever the, the vaccine, whatever your preparation was, and then you drew blood from the animal and you tested the the, the blood for antibody activity against the blood. And the test that, that the, and this all came out of microbiology and bacteriology, the tests, and then ultimately virology, the tests that any that everybody had was they could grow the bug either in um, in the test tube, or if it was a virus, they had to grow the bug in other cells, but they could show that their antibody activity neutralized the ability of the bug to, to, to grow and or to infect other cells and neutralize the, uh, the microbe. And so from that point on until today, 
neutralizing antibody activity is the sine qua non. You can do that. That gives you, and then lots of experiments and so forth that went on, it gives you the, the, um, the ability then to predict that those people, if they have neutralizing antibodies, probably, but not 100%, um, uh, will be immune. And of course, that's the big question right now in, in the coronavirus um, saga that we're undergoing, because now they've, they've, enough people have lived through the, back, the, um, the infection, and they're beginning to, to report, and just today, Governor Cuomo uh, has new data from, I think it was 21% of New Yorkers have antibody activity, neutralizing antibody activity, or antibody activity, I'm not sure it's neutralizing yet. Um, against the coronavirus, which is good, but that means that 80% of the people are still susceptible. And if 80% if 80 of the people are still susceptible, and we go back to the beaches, and we go back to the restaurants, and, and we, you know, uh, so forth, we're just basically throwing gasoline on the fire. It's not, Sasele problem. And um, so, in the history of, of vaccination, the next thing that happened uh, after Pasteur and, and then von Behring in, in Kitasato in 1890 <clears throat> was 40 years later, or 30 years later, in 1918, was the influenza, the great influenza epidemic, pandemic. And that's important for us today in coronavirus times is because of the fact that influenza virus, although it's an entirely different virus, uh, causes the same kind of uh, infection. And that is in the um, airways, upper airways, but also the bad uh, flu gets down into the lungs and causes a, a viral pneumonia. And the viral pneumonia then compromises the ability of the tiny little air sacs to um, exchange oxygen and CO2 because they fill up with inflammatory fluid. And that, <clears throat> that's the major problem. And worldwide, in, in the 1918 flu epidemic, that started in the spring of 1918 and went then through into the winter and, and the beginning of 1919, 50 million people died worldwide. And, and there, was only, there were two billion people in the world in 1918. So that was like two and a half percent. And if you multiply that times seven billion today, you get to a, a total of um, 175 million people would die. And so that was a big deal actually. And it really set the case for, for the whole science of <clears throat> immunology from 1918 until 1960. So over 40 years, most of the people, if you were anybody in the business, you were studying flu. And one investigator in particular contributed the most to, to that whole quest, and that was McFarlane Burnett, who was this physician down in, in Australia, who ultimately, ultimately I covered in one of the other videos, went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1960 for his, for his um, uh, elucidation or thoughts uh, and theories about how the immune system works, which was all taken from his experiments <coughs> with flu over the course of, of, of his entire career. And so flu, at the time that the influenza epidemic occurred, they, um, <coughs> excuse me, they didn't know what, what a virus was yet. The, most of the scientists were focused on a bacteria that ultimately became called Haemophilus influenza. And it's a, it's a pretty common bug um, in our nasopharynx. And so they started culturing it from a lot of people, <clears throat> but not always. They couldn't get a hundred, you know, if people died of, it, of flu, there were some people that didn't have any <laughs> Haemophilus influenza. Um, and that sort of bothered them, but they, but most of all the investigators thought it was due to a bacteria. And it wasn't until, um, it wasn't until 1931 or 1933 
um, in humans uh, that a filterable agent was discovered, and that was the flu virus. Um, so that was 1933 in humans in, in London. And then in 1943, lo and behold, the World War II was on. And just like World War I, the, um, the powers that be were very anxious that they didn't lose their soldiers to the virus before they got a chance to be killed on the front. <laughs> so they, they put a, they, they wanted, they needed a vaccine for flu. And so they, even though <clears throat> Pasteur had basically laid down the law that you had to have a live bug that had been attenuated, Nobody, nobody had a live flu virus that had been attenuated. So they did, they did the next best thing, and they, they, um, they grew up lots of virus. They, they knew, because of Burnett's experiments, they knew how to do this by then. And they fixed it. They, they killed the virus with um, formaldehyde. And then they, <clears throat> they started giving it to all the GIs. And in 1943, they inoculated every GI that came through the boot camp. And um, the interesting thing about this story is that Jonas Salk was a young lieutenant in the army at that time, and he was assigned to be involved in the clinical trials with the first flu vaccines that ultimately were shown to work. And so they didn't lose very many people to flu in, in World War II. And it wasn't until but Salk knew that Pasteur was wrong. It, it didn't have to be a live thing. It, you could kill it with, flu, with formalin, and then it would work. And so the next thing that happened in the whole history of vaccination was, was polio. And polio it was sort of like um, smallpox. I mean, it was a big deal. And then because these poor little kids were becoming paralyzed to it if they didn't die, with it and so forth. And Jonas Salk came through and decided to make a vaccine for polio. Some investigators at Harvard had had found that they could grow it in, um, uh, in tissue culture. And he took their, uh, their data and grew up, grew up huge quantities of, of um, polio virus and fixed it with formalin did all kinds of experiments uh, before getting into the clinic, but then took it into the clinic in, in terms of um, some um, schools. Uh, he, was at, he was from the University of Pittsburgh and inoculated or injected, I'm sorry, um, uh, kids, crippled, kids who were crippled and in the crippled kids' home with uh, polio virus, polio vaccine, to see if it would work. And long story short, that was 1955. It, it went it went nationwide with money from FDR and, and the March of Dimes, and so that everybody was lining up to get their kids inoculated or injected. And that was um, that that was really the most successful modern vaccine that ever happened. Uh, but Jonas Salk was not accepted. By the, by the real aficionados, the cognoscenti in, in immunology and in medicine and, and, and in microbiology, virology. Because he wasn't, he, you know, he, he didn't go to Harvard. He was from the University of Pittsburgh. And so ultimately they gave the Nobel Prize to the guys that had grown it from heart, that grown the virus in, in the tissue culture, and they never, never gave the Nobel Prize to John Salk, which I always thought was a crime. But anyway, and that's beside the point. Uh, uh, Albert Sabin then came on with a live attenuated va vaccine for polio for polio in 1961, six years later. And then after that, in 63 and 67 and 69, and we got measles, we got rubella, we got, uh, and then on to uh, mumps, forgot mumps. And, uh, and then on the chicken pox and so forth. And so we're now basically pretty much up to modern times. And all those viral uh, vaccinations were done with live attenuated 
virus. They learned, and what they did was they grew these, they, they, they had to grow the virus in, in cells because viruses cannot survive by themselves and replicate. They have to be inside cells because they use the, the metabolism of the cell and all the other uh, molecules to help them replicate. And um, they just would grow them and grow them and grow them and grow them. And then they'd, every now and then they test to see whether the virus had lost its, um, um, its virulence. And of course, that's how Sabin had done the, the polio virus. And ultimately it would happen. These viruses would lose their virulence and those were what were used then for the vaccines because they were live, because Pasteur said it had to be that way. And so they didn't know why though. They didn't know what happened to the virus to make it lose its virulence. And it turns out that basically they've gone back now and looked at the polio virus, for example, and I think all the rest of them as well. And they found that there's just multiple mutations throughout the genome of the virus. And, and I think that they now know which genes are important for polio virulence, but it's only, it's only come out in the last few years. I mean, they, they, they didn't, they just didn't know that. And now with molecular genetics and genetic engineering and, and sequencing and all these other different kinds of things that we can do, they can then purposefully um, take genes out of, of a virus or put other genes in their place and then test the, uh, the gene, the, the, the engineered virus to see whether or not it's attenuated or it's not attenuated and so forth. And they can also take critical genes out that are that encode for the molecules on the surface of the virus that bind to the, to, usually they bind to receptors on cells and that's how they get into our cells so that they can take that gene, those genes out and mutate them, put them back in again. So now the virus, the virus can't get, can't bind to that receptor. Or now they can, they can generate, they can use that, that engineered virus to raise antibodies to the altered molecule that would still bind and prevent the whole thing from happening, happening to the wild type virus. Well, the next thing that happened in the history of vaccines then was um, um, was HIV. And HIV was a big deal too. Um, Bob Gallo, who stole the virus from the French and then claimed that he, that he discovered it himself, now, when he announced the discovery that he had the, the virus in 1983, um, he, he called HIV the the, uh, the plague of uh, of all centuries because it was sexually transmitted. He figured it was going to wipe out the, our species of humans. Um, but he also predicted in 1983 that we'd have a vaccine in three months. But now it's almost 40 years later, we still don't have a vaccine. So when Tony Fauci and, and the other scientists have told the politicians that, that we'll have a vaccine for coronavirus within uh, one to one and a half years, I mean, that's the biggest hope ever. Um, because look at HIV. I think the rule of thumb here is, is that if you have an infection, an infectious disease that does not by itself um, result in, in immunity in a certain fraction of the individuals who are infected, you're probably not gonna be able to make a vaccine out of that one. And that's the case with HIV. Um, the bug has figured out ways around the immune system one of the primary ones is that it infects the cells of the immune system, the T cells. And there's other things that it also does to prevent antibodies, neutralizing antibodies from being developed and from, from working, which has really stymied the, uh, the immunologic community and the whole HIV community for all this time. The other thing that happened, that has happened since 1980, between eight, 1980 and now, so it's 30 years, or uh, almost 40 years. The, um, with genetic engineering, we've been able to create all kinds of vaccines. 
and and I won't go through all the different kinds of vaccines that are possibly to be created, but there's multiple different kinds of vaccines. And right now, it's been kind of, uh, it's been in the news and so forth that there's 40, 40, 41 different coronavirus vaccines that are that are being created and being worked on and so forth and so on. And of course, everybody is hoping that some of those vaccines are going to work. Well, the thing is, this is not our first rodeo with coronaviruses. We had SARS or COVID-1 in 2003, and we had MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, from 2012-13. And now it's 2020-2019. And we have copy two. And so the question that you should be asking yourself is, so what about SARS and MERS? Do we have vaccines against them? Well, if you, and the answer is no. There are vaccines that have been created uh, for both SARS and MERS, all different kinds of vaccines. And they've been tested in small animals, like usually mice, larger animals, subhuman primates and also the the phase one clinical trials have been done with some of the vaccines both with SARS and with MERS and the data by and large don't look so bad <clears throat> look pretty good both in the, in the animals as well as the phase one trials in the humans but it wasn't de it wasn't felt to be financially um, you know what are you going to make money against MERS? It's gone. We don't have that anymore, right? And so I think the bottom line is at this point in time, we got to get, we, it's clear that we need to get a virus. I need a vaccine for this particular virus. And I should say back with the discussion on HIV, the pressure was taken off uh, the vaccines because we got good therapies. And we have therapies now that can, that can extend the lives of, of an infected person until you know they no longer are dying before their, their cohorts in the population, which is probably good because we couldn't make we haven't been able to make a vaccine. So, with regard to uh, coronavirus, um, there's a lot of data that have been accumulated and generated in with SARS and MERS vaccines that that look pretty good. There are some there are some problems um, because it, it it's, it's also possible that you, your vaccine can. Uh, let's see, where was I? So, um, yeah, you can. Sometimes vaccines can can actually facilitate infection by the wild type um, bug. And it happened. Um, it happened in, in some of these trials with both SARS and MERS. So they're well aware of that, and they're worried about that. And so they're going to look for that very carefully. Now, the the, the thing about vaccines, and this is going back to, to Jenner and the little boy, the eight-year-old boy who lived down the street, to um, Pasteur when he was able to challenge his his chickens and his sheep and his cows, and so forth. Nowadays, you can't really do that. You can, but it's unethical to do that, right? And let's say you have, you're, you're worried about HIV and they come up with a new vaccine for HIV. Are you going to let them vaccinate you and then challenge you with live HIV? I, I don't think so. And so that's the problem. So they've, they've worked out a, a way to <clears throat> test vaccines without challenging them. And so there's two things that a vaccine, so vaccines have to go through all the preclinical uh, animals and so forth and so on. But then once they go into humans, they go into <coughs> small numbers of humans, less than a thousand, probably less than a few hundred, just to test the vaccine to make sure it's safe. It doesn't cause any weird uh, adverse events and, uh, or problems in and of itself. And so in order to do this, they, they take like um, four to six people at a time and they give it, you also have to find the right dose. 
So you give them the lowest dose, way even 10, 20, 100 fold lower than you would uh, even think to give anybody. You, you start down there and you do four to six people and then you do four to six more at a little bit higher dose and so forth. And you build up over time this, and you're looking, you're looking for uh, adverse events and you're also testing these people for antibody activity. Because that's the easiest thing to test for, number one. Number two, it's the sine qua non. If it's a neutralizing antibody, <clears throat> that it's doing what you're hoping it will do. Well, that takes a while. You know, that, that takes months, years. You get to months anyway. Build up and find out what the dose is and so forth. The other thing is that you have to also test the route of administration. And I, I have a little story about that. The tradition is in, in vaccines and in uh, immunology is, is that for whatever reason, and it's never really been explained to me, it goes back to experiments way back in the early part of the 20th century, that when, when investigators in, injected the skin, they injected a lot of antigens and a lot of vaccines into the skin of people, primarily because they could look at the skin and, and see whether or not there was an inflammatory response. And this goes back to the smallpox days. Um, and so injections into the skin or just under the skin were as one of the favorite ways to, to test a vaccine. And another way was to put it with a big needle directly into the muscle, either in the deltoid muscle or in the end of your bottom. And um, both of those ways are, are really the traditional ways you'll get a vaccine today. If you go to, the, you know, I just got a shingles vaccine the other day, and it was an intramuscular injection. Um, <clears throat> so once you decide on, on the dose and the route of administration and it's safe, then you have to test for efficacy. And when you test for efficacy, you can't challenge, you, you can give the vaccine at the dose and, admit, and route that, you, that you've worked out already. But now you don't know whether, and you can test for antibody activity. And, and you do that, um, but you can't challenge them with, with live bug. And so what, what you do is um, you go into an endemic area where there's a lot of uh, disease going on and you test a bunch of people, hopefully you'll have t tests by then so you can find out that they're not infected. <clears throat> and you take, and now we're up into a, several thousand people because you work it out mathematically, what, what kinds, if you see a response, how many people do you need in order to be confident that that's a, a valid, statistically significant response? So you go into this area, and depending on the incidence of the infection, then it depends on the number of people that you're going to have to have in your study. And you have a control group that, that'll only get a, plus, a placebo. And then the other group that will get um, vac vaccine. And that takes time. And so that takes, usually it takes several years because you gotta vaccinate all these people and then you have to wait for them just to get, just to get an infection by the normal, by the normal circulation within the community and so forth. So that's where we are. And that's why it's, it's really a stretch that we're going to have a vaccine in 18 months. Even though we have some experience with vaccines against SARS and with MERS. Now there's, there's, some, there's some two things that have happened just within the past few weeks uh, that are very, very interesting on this question. Some of the epidemiologists, that are the best, epidemi most celebrated epidemiologists in the world, one from Harvard and another one, I think, from London and another one someplace else, have published a paper in the Journal of Infectious Diseases saying that what we ought to do, that we can't afford to wait. This is a pandemic. This is an emergency. This is a crisis. We're going to have to challenge normal human volunteers. And they go through in this paper justifying the ethics of that. Now they say, okay, well, we're going to try to minimize any deaths, and so we're going to take young um, people who don't have any um, underlying illnesses and so forth and so on. And just this week in Nature, I've, I noticed there was an editorial or a, a news item saying that 
already in England, they have 1,500 people that have volunteered to be volunteers um, to get get inoculated uh, and challenged. So I found I found that interesting, and I think I think that's going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised because people are so because because we you know here we are in New York New York City that has the the highest incidence in the United States and only 20% of the people in the community have are immune. But we can't wait for 80. I mean, we would wait for 60 to 80% of them to become immune through the natural way. We're going to be here for a while in our lockdown. <laughs> and that ain't going to happen. I don't think. The, the, the capitalists will not let that happen. So, uh, <laughs> Now, another thing, another paper that came out about a month ago that was interesting was a paper from people I know at the NIH. That, uh, and, and the chief investigator was Bob Cedar from the Vaccine Research Center. And there, there were indications, there were papers that had come out about a vaccine for tuberculosis that's called BCG. BCG stands for Bacillus Calmet Guerin. Calmet and Guerin were investigators at the Pasteur Institute uh, in Paris that had uh, done a sort of a, a retake on Jenner's smallpox vaccine. They found a they found they've isolated uh, TB organisms from cows. So it was a bovine it caused bovine tuberculosis, and they cultured it and cultured it and pasteurized it, and the way Pasteur said it ought to be done. They made a vaccine, and um, they started using it all over Europe, and they, they also used it in the States. Um, but they had difficulty with their clinical trials um, because of t tuberculosis was so endemic, uh, particularly in Europe, that a lot of people were already infected, but they walled off the tuberculosis um, in their lungs or wherever it was in their body. Um, and they, they were fine. But later on in their lives, if their immunity waned for whatever reason and so forth, the, the TB bugs could then break out and cause a recrudescence of the disease. And so with that in the background, it was very difficult to show that your tuberculosis vaccine was really working uh, and, and so forth. So in, the, in Europe, it's, it's used, it's still used as far as I know. So everybody gets um, a BCG vaccination. But in our country, in the United States, they, they, it was not endemic enough so that they thought they needed it. It was better for them to just wait to see how many people got infected and, and, they, and so forth. And so they never used it here in our country. Well, Bob Cedar at the Vaccine Research Center had seen papers out that said if you gave the vaccine intravenously, not in the skin and not in the muscle, but put it directly into the, into the vein and shoot it in there, that it was better. And so they did a very meticulous study that, that, that was published in, I think, Nature this year that showed that if you get in both in mice and also in monkeys, that if you gave an IV and then challenged the mice or the monkeys with um, through the airways, that you, you could show 90% protection against tuberculosis on the nets. That is phenomenal and i sent that to one of my friends in japan and he said he said well kendall they should use that for coronavirus and i said yeah because what happens when you put it in iv where does it go well the, the venous system dumps all the blood into the right side of the heart which then pumps it into the lungs so it goes into the lungs and in the lungs then what they could show in, in their studies, now that they have immunological assays that have been developed over the, particularly over since 1980, it's the lungs then are congregated by T cells, the T lymphocytes, that are the good cells of the immune system. And um, so then when you challenge them down through the respiratory tract, the T cells are, are sitting there and they've been immunized and, and they basically deal with it. And they don't, didn't even get symptomatic, and that's the same with that. And those guys at the Vaccine Research Center 
are probably as smart as me. And so you know that they're going to do that for coronavirus. And so I'll stop there.